Okay, well, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you very much for joining us on this webinar this morning. And um, for those of you who don't know us, um, my name is Abigail Lynch, and I am a solicitor in the employment team at Forbes. And um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Trishna Medessa Parekh, who is also a solicitor in the employment team. Um, and this morning, we're going to hopefully um, provide you with some guidance on the recent updates to the coronavirus job retention scheme. And in particular, we're going to look at the introduction of flexible furlough, um, which came into effect on the 1st of July. Um, so before we get going, I'll just run through some general housekeeping. Um, all of your cameras are turned off and you are muted. Um, we are quite pushed for time, but the plan is to save around 10 to 15 minutes at the end to take some questions. Um, we have already had a number of questions submitted in advance of the webinar, so thank you very much uh, to all those who, who sent the questions through. Um, we're going to address these at the end and if anybody else has any other questions sort of as the webinar progresses if we can ask that you do wait until the end of the webinar to ask these and also to use the q a function at the bottom um, to ask any questions that you might have um, and I, I touched upon it earlier but for those of you who are a bit later to join the session and um, we are recording the webinar and a link will be sent out um, along with a survey and we'd really appreciate sort of any feedback that you might have on the session. Um, we'll also send out our contact details so that if we are pushed for time towards the end and um, then you do at least have our details and you know we'll be more than happy to answer any follow-up questions that you may have um, or any questions which we weren't able to, um, to cover. Um, okay. Bear with me, I just made the slides. Um, so if we take a look then at the coronavirus job retention scheme um, in its current form, um, there are now at least uh, 10 different government guidance documents in relation to the scheme itself, um, as well as um, three Treasury directives. Um, and I think the, the pictures sort of on this slide are you know, an accurate reflection of how I'm sure we've all been feeling as the updates have continued to be dropped um, after five o'clock on a Friday. Um, and, and just sort of on that, it's actually quite worrying the number of pictures that there are on Google Images of Boris Johnson with his head in his hands. Um, but I'm sure that these pictures are all something that we can relate to. Um, but what this means then, I guess, is that you know, any employers wishing to claim under the new flexible furlough scheme um, will firstly have a, a huge amount of government guidance to navigate. And secondly, um, whilst the idea of a flexible furlough itself um, seems fairly straightforward, um, in practice, it has a potential to be quite complex. Um, in particular, there are some tricky calculations um, which may need to be made by you know, either you guys or um, your payroll teams. Um, and there's also a lot of detail contained in the guidance. Um, so what we're aiming to do today is, is summarise you know, all of that guidance um, for you. Um, so in terms of where we're up to then, um, new and updated guidance was published on the 12th of June um, to reflect the changes to the job retention scheme from the 1st of July. And um, we also had a, a Treasury directive that was published on the 26th of June. And in terms of that, um, the Treasury directive has um, more legal force than the guidance, um, but it is quite difficult to read. Um, and, and sort of that's, that's coming from a lawyer. Um, so I'd suggest that, you know, the guidance is the best place to start. Um, but if you need more detail, um, then have a read of the Treasury Directive. Um, and if you can't get your head around that, then, you know, please do get in touch with us. Um, but in summary then, from the 1st of July, um, employers are able to bring furloughed employees back to work on a flexible basis. Um, whilst still being able to claim the, the government grant for the hours that are not worked, okay? So the focus is on, you know, getting people back to work part-time with the aim of easing people back into work and, you know, to help with the gradual opening back up of the economy um, and hopefully avoiding any, any large-scale redundancies. And, you know, if you think back to, um, you know, Rishi Sunak's first announcement on the scheme, 
he made it very clear that you know that was very much the purpose of the scheme. Um, so from the 1st of August, the level of government grant will be reduced each month um, and employers will be required to contribute towards the cost of furloughing employees. Um, and we're going to look at the specifics of this in a bit more detail shortly. Um, there's also a cap on the number of employees that can be included in each claim um, from the 1st of July onwards. And again, we'll touch on this um, in a bit more detail shortly. Um, and just to recap then, um, you know, the scheme is due to close on the 31st of October and, you know, there can't be any new entrants to the scheme after the 1st of July. Um, so before we look at the scheme itself then, um, we are just going to run a quick poll. Um, so Gabs, if you could just launch the first poll for us um, and then if you can all just take a few, mimi few minutes sorry, to, to read uh, and answer the question, um, all of your answers will be submitted anonymously. Um, so the question then is, have you started using the flexible furlough scheme yet? And the options are yes, um, no, not yet, but we plan on utilising it or not yet and we aren't planning on using it. So I'll just give you all a couple of minutes just to, to vote on that for us. I quit. Oh, there we go. I was just waiting, <laughs> waiting for the, the results to pop up. So 53% of you then have, have said, yes, you've already started using the flexible furlough scheme. Um, and we've got 26% who say not yet, but we'll plan on utilising it. And 21% and actually who have said not yet and we aren't planning on using it. Um, okay, so, so that's great. But for those of you who've already introduced it or those of you are, who are thinking of, of you know, utilising it, then hopefully this, you know, you, you'll get something useful out of the webinar today and we'll sort of guide you through, you know, how you should go about doing that. Okay, so I'll just move on to the next slide. Bear with me. Um, okay, so if we have a look then at the flexible furlough scheme itself, um, and as somebody quite cleverly pointed out to, to me and some of my colleagues, um, you know, don't think about the acronym for flexible furlough scheme. Um, but in terms of what the flexible furlough scheme is then and how it works, um, from the 1st of July, um, the flexible scheme will allow employers to bring back employees um, steadily, on varied working patterns um, and or you know, reduced hours to meet the needs of the business. Um, there is no limit or restrictions on the working arrangements that can be agreed. Um, and so essentially, employees will be able to you know, return to work on a part-time basis as determined by the needs of the business. Um, any employers that utilize the flexible furlough scheme will be required to pay employees in full for the hours that they work um, and this will not be recoverable under the job retention scheme. Um, so in other words, um, it will be at the company's expense as was the norm um, prior to COVID-19. Um, and just to be clear, this includes paying the tax and employer national insurance contributions that are due on those amounts. Okay, but what an employer can recover under the scheme is wages for the hours that the employee does not work, which they would usually have worked if it wasn't for COVID-19. In terms of who is eligible to be furloughed under the new scheme then, um, only employees who have been furloughed for at least three weeks on or before the 30th of June under the old scheme um, can be furloughed after the 1st of July. Um, so only employees then who started furlough on or before the 10th of June are eligible for the, the new flexible scheme essentially. Um, the only exceptions to this are employees returning to work after taking a period of statutory parental leave um, or a military reservist on a period of mobilisation and they are the exceptions to that. So these employees will be eligible to be furloughed after the 10th of June and um, even if they are being furloughed for the first time and um, provided you know that the company has submitted a furlough claim and um, for any other employee for at least three consecutive weeks between the 1st of March and the 30th of June. Okay. So essentially what this means then is if you haven't previously furloughed someone um, and you can't actually furlough them now, um, that's where the no new entrance from the 1st of July rule comes from. Um, one thing to note is that the new flexible furlough scheme isn't replacing you know, the old furlough as such. 
um, in that if there is no need um, you know, for, for the employees to return to work, you know, if there is no work for them, um, they can remain on full-time furlough um, and the business can continue to claim the grant, um, albeit it's going to be on a tapered basis, which we'll touch on shortly, um, you know, for the full hours under the existing rules. Okay. Um, and, and another thing just to note, during the furloughed hours under the flexible scheme, um, you know, the same rules apply um, as in the original job retention scheme, um, an employee cannot undertake any work for you um, or provide any services to you. Okay. In terms of the duration of furlough then, um, the previous requirements that furlough periods must last a minimum of three consecutive weeks um, no longer applies as of the 1st of July. Um, and from that date, flexible furlough arrangements can last any amount of time um, and there's no limit on the restrictions on the working arrangements of furloughed employees. Um, workers will be able to work as much or as little as the business needs um, and I think this is a critical part of the scheme um, essentially you know it's the flexibility so you know the government have recognized that there needed to be more flexibility in the scheme and um, so as to allow businesses to, to start operating again and you know kick start the economy back up um, under the initial scheme, we saw, you know, a lot of clients and businesses uh, rotating staff on, on and off furloughs of every three weeks, um, you know, so as to satisfy that minimum three week requirement. Um, under the new scheme, you can still rotate, um, but the relaxation of the rules means that, you know, rotations can be made on, on a more frequent basis. Um, the only caveat to that is that any claims under the job retention scheme must be for a minimum of seven calendar days. Um, so the minimum HMRC claim period that employees can claim for is seven calendar days. Okay. And just one final thing um, from me to flag um, before I hand you over to Trishna. Um, it relates to the question you know, that we've received from a, a number of different clients, I guess. Um, workers can enter into a flexible furlough agreement more than once, okay? Um, and on that note, I will hand you over to my colleague, Trishna, um, who is going to look at the need to have, um, you know, flexible furlough agreement itself in more detail. Bear with us, guys. We're, we're trying to social distance at the same time um, as shuffling around a room without falling off chairs. So <laughs> that went successfully, I think. <laughs> um, so obviously, thank you, Abby, um, for the introduction. So we're going to look at the flexible furlough agreement itself, which Abby has just touched on. Um, so once you've decided you're bringing employees back off furlough, um, which some of you have already done and some of you are already using the scheme, so that's brilliant. Um, you've got to now start thinking about what hours and what work you've actually got available and how many hours someone is needed to be doing their role. Um, and what we would always say as lawyers is always document everything in writing. And actually on this, the guidance is very clear that you need to have a written agreement um, in place that sets out what the working pattern is, how the flexible arrangements are going to work. And this is key because we're not currently sure how strict HMRC are going to be with this when they go back and audit um, in a couple of years, which we're thinking they are going to do because they have required all records to be kept, including, you know, your previous furlough agreements, your initial ones. Um, you need to be keeping records of hours worked, hours claimed for, and of course, this agreement itself. And they've asked for that to be kept for five um, or six years because the guidance is actually contradicted um, because the claim guide says six years and the rest of the guidance says five. So to be on the safe side, we'd just say keep it for the longer period. Um, and obviously that would indicate to us that HMRC are planning to come back and look through these records and make sure that the scheme has been used properly and we don't know how that's going to work at present. So another thing that's not quite clear from the guidance is that it says that you do need to enter into an agreement um, and it's not clear whether you do that every time you flexi furlough someone or, or whether every time you change someone's shift pattern or working hours that you're going to need them for that week. Now, in our view, that would be very onerous and cumbersome. It's going to increase the amount of records. It's going to make it really difficult because you've got to, to issue this every time. So I think the way that we're seeing it at the minute is that 
provided this agreement itself covers off all the points from the beginning, that it's probably okay to have one agreement um, and then perhaps use a side letter or you know, emails or some sort of documentary evidence that supplements that agreement with what you're then agreeing week by week. Um, now, whether you're a retainer client or not, please feel free to contact us to get this agreement in place because that is key um, and, and we are more than happy to assist with that. So how do we calculate flexi furlough pay? I think this picture was definitely me at the start of furlough when I was trying to get my head around how we calculate costs. Um, and I think it's slightly easier with the flexi furlough scheme than it was initially, now that we've got our head around it. And that provided you've got all the relevant bits already worked out, then it does make the calculation a lot easier. However, as lawyers, maths isn't our strong point. So I would recommend that you take advice from your accountants on this if you're unsure how this is being done or if you want to double check a calculation you've done. Um, HMRC have launched a, a helpful calculator online. Now it doesn't work for all scenarios um, but I think it works for most of them so it's worth checking that out and see if you can input the data you've got and if it comes out with the right calculation. Um, so before calculating the amount of furlough you need to check a couple of things. Firstly you know, are you working off the two and a half thousand pound cap? Have you got the 80% of the wages calculated and ready? You need to work out the usual hours that somebody works. Now, if you've got someone contracted to a set number of hours per week on a fixed salary, that's obviously a lot easier. If you've got someone with variable hours, then you're looking at the average number of hours across the tax year 2019 to 2020 um, or the calendar period. And then it's whichever amount of hours is higher. If an employee was on annual leave or statutory leave or off sick at any time before the 19th of March 2020, then you need to calculate that average without taking those into consideration um, in order to make it fair for the employee and that it's not bringing that average down massively. So there has been some confusion as well as to whether the calculations need to be based on calendar days or working days. The guidance actually says calendar days. However, we have been told by some accountants, so don't quote me on it because we didn't work this out, but they've spent hours working out the difference and apparently it only came to a couple of pounds. Therefore, if you have been doing it based on working days rather than calendar days and you are a couple of pounds out, I wouldn't panic. Our advice would be to keep it consistent and stick with what you've been doing. Um, however, if you get an employee challenging how you've calculated something, the best approach would really to be to say to them, well, can you show to us how you've calculated it and on what basis, compare that to how you've done it and see what the difference is. If it is this small nuance of calendar and working days, then obviously that can be rectified and, and you can reimburse them for the, the, the couple of pounds. Hopefully it is a couple of pounds only um, that that is. And if they have actually got a calculation that seems to have been correct, then obviously we can go back and rectify those now um, but don't be too accepting of employees coming forward with their own calculations or you will be opening up a huge can of worms. So we've put a very basic example um, up on the slide for you here. We've got Joe Bloggs who works for Forbes Limited. I was clearly feeling very creative on this day um, and he works 40 hours per week. He's being brought back on the 1st of July to work 10 hours per week until the 31st but he normally would have worked 160 hours in total, but across the month he's going to be doing uh, 40 only. So he's furloughed for 120 hours. So to work this out, we've already worked out what his usual wage will be, and we, we've got that at 1,800 to keep it nice and easy. Um, and then we've multiplied that by the number of hours he was furloughed, which is the 120 and divided it by 160, which is what he usually would have done. And therefore, the pay that's come out is £1,350. Now, as I said, this is a very basic example. And if you go on the HMRC uh, on gov.uk, they've done a sort of toolkit of all the coronavirus job retention scheme guides. One of them is examples. Um, and there is a really helpful um, set of guidance with a couple of different examples with people with usual hours and with varied hours that you can use. So I would strongly urge you to have a look at that. So Abby mentioned before that there is some tapering of the scheme, which we thought we would touch on in this session as well. 
um, and, and we did actually cover this in, in another session as well. Um, on For this month, for July, nothing is really going to be changing in terms of contribution. The employees are still receiving 80% um, and national insurance and pension funds are being covered by the grant. Um, and the only change this month was the introduction of the flexible furlough, which was actually, Rishi Sunak said, was uh, brought forward a month it was meant to come in next month so that was of course well welcome news for a lot of employers who have now been able to reopen but just don't have enough work to cover all the hours from the 1st of august till the end of august from an employee's perspective nothing changes they still get their 80 percent if they're on full furlough and they'll still get 80 percent for the hours that they're furloughed under the flexible scheme. However, from an employer's point of view, you are then going to be contributing the national insurance and the pension uh, contributions. Now, for most employers, if you've got people on minimum wage at hourly rates, it's not going to massively affect the business. Um, so we wouldn't panic just yet. Um, and just obviously bear that in mind when budgeting for the next couple of months. From the beginning of September to the end of September, that's when the first bigger contribution comes in. And as an employer, you will only be getting back 70% of the grant rather than the 80. So that means as an employer, you're contributing 10% plus the national insurance and pension contributions. So, and that is capped there. We've put 312 pounds and 50 pence on the slide. That is how much you will be capped at contributing at that point. Um, so again, not a massive amount, no need to panic, um, but it is worth if you've got a lot of employees um, considering how that's going to quickly stack up um, and whether you can budget for that in advance. Then in, finally in October, in the last month of the scheme, um, the contribution will then be 60% from the government and you will be topping up 20% plus national insurance. And, and pension funds. Now, that is based on the fact you've not topped up to 100% in the first place. So if you have been topping it up, then obviously the contribution and the amount the employer is, is putting forward is a lot higher. Um, so you may want to think about that when you are considering what we're going to come on to shortly, uh, a little bit about redundancies. Um, you know, if you are planning redundancies, then you might want to think ahead about how the scheme is being tapered, how that's going to affect your budgeting and planning and see how this month goes if you've only recently reopened, see what kind of income you've got before making those decisions. Um, we have been asked the question as to whether you can ask employees to actually agree a reduction for the hours they're working. So not just paying them 80% when they're on furlough, but can you be paying them 80% when they're actually working? Well, there's no reason why that can't happen, but it's not an automatic thing. Um, again, just as you did initially, you have to seek their agreement to that reduction. Um, and the only way you're really going to do that is if you are very convincing in your argument for why and what the consequences could be to the business or to them uh, individually if they didn't agree that. So uh, we're not really advising employers to go away and start trying to reduce everyone's pay. But if you are massively struggling um, and you are on the brink of having to to make redundancies or to consider, you know, insolvency liquidation and things like that, then this may be an option that can help you to, to survive. So it, it is worth thinking about. And perhaps if, you, if you've got employees that you think may be understanding on a temporary basis, it may be worth seeing if you can get that. Now, if you do, obviously, as I said before, everything needs to be in writing. We need to be communicating that consultation making sure it's well documented so you can show that you've done that as well. So we've just popped on the slide a useful uh, snippet that summarises uh, these tapered changes over the next couple of months. Um, but you can find, like I said, on, on the toolkit online, all of this information, which is pretty easy to use. And as Abby said, it's actually easier to use that than the Treasury direction. So start with the guidance. So I'll hand back over to Abby now, hopefully a smooth transition. <laughs> Thank you, Trishna. Um, yeah, so if we move on then to having a look at actually, you know, choosing employees for flexible furlough. Um, the question of deciding who to place on, on flexible furlough, you know, who perhaps to leave on full furlough, um, you know, and who actually should be working um, as normal. 
is likely to be a difficult one for business businesses and you know it's certainly a question that, that we've been um, continually asked you know by clients and um, you know how do we go about you know deciding who's furloughed um, and who isn't um one thing to note then is you know you, you do not need to offer all of your employees flexible furlough leave um so you know you may choose to leave some staff fully furloughed um, you know, or as I mentioned, actually require them to work as normal. Um, as I did touch upon earlier, um, it is also in keeping with the scheme, you know, to rotate periods of, of full furlough with periods of work um, or flexible furlough, um, you know, provided that both members of staff, you know, who you're rotating have been previously furloughed and are otherwise eligible under the scheme. Um, I guess the starting point then is to consider, you know, the business needs. Um, which roles are critical to the business functioning and um, which roles are in demand um, and it's the needs of the business that ought to you know drive your decision um, as ever and um, care must be taken to avoid you know any direct or indirect discrimination um, in the selection process um, and you know if you must um, select between staff doing identical roles um, then you may wish to consider either asking for volunteers um, to work and um, having a selection matrix perhaps, you know, akin to in a, a redundancy selection exercise or, um, you know, using a method of randomised selection. And um, some other things that you may, all wish, may also wish, you know, to factor into your assessment and um, whether there are any staff who fall within any of the high risk or shielding categories I mean, you know, and in this sense, could fully furloughing them actually offer, you know, a way to minimise their risk. Um, you might also want to consider whether any members of staff want, want to be fully furloughed, you know, because they have um, caring responsibilities, perhaps, you know, including, um, you know, caring for an individual who is shielding, for example. That's something that, you know, we initially at the outset, we were asked, um, you know, quite a lot in terms of what is the position on this. Um, you know, or actually, is it just easier to have, um, you know, staff rotating between periods of work, flexible furlough leave and, you know, periods of full furlough leave. Um, but ultimately, you know, any plan should be driven by the needs of the business um, and, you know, in particular, which job roles and skills are needed in the workplace. Okay. Um, this question then, I mean, I have touched upon it, but just to be absolutely clear, you know, can an employer keep employees fully furloughed? Um, and the answer to this is yes, you can, um, you know, provided obviously that no work is carried out. Um, although that is the case, and um, I guess my advice would be, you know, to avoid doing this where possible. Um, the flexible furlough scheme is intended to, you know, assist employers in getting their business back on track, you know, both from an operating perspective, um, but also from the perspective of, you know, by the end of October, the scheme is no longer going to be in place. And so businesses, you know, need to be in a position to be able to take over the full costs of, you know, paying employees by the end of October. Um, so, you know, if a business was to um, keep all of its employees on furlough without bringing, you know, anybody back to work um, whatsoever, I think it will be difficult, um, you know, to, to re-establish the business, um, you know, and to be able to essentially produce, you know, sufficient profits to pay employees when, when the scheme does come to an end. Um, and as Trisha sort of discussed, even where an employer does not bring um, you know furloughed employees back to work from July and um, you know the employers costs of actually keeping employees on furlough will increase um, each month from August you know making it increasingly costly for um, you know for you as an employer to keep employees on furlough without them even working um, okay but just on the flip side of that, I guess, something else to bear in mind, you know, employers who utilise the scheme, you know, obviously will be required to pay employees in full for the hours that they work, unless, as Trisha mentioned, you know, an agreement um, is otherwise reached in terms of, of them having a pay reduction on the full, full hours that they do work. Um, so, you know, this payment will not be recoverable under the scheme. Um, and sort of with this and, you know, the level of the government grant 
being set to be due from the 1st of August. And um, any businesses looking to, you know, utilize the scheme should firstly, um, you know, do the math before implementing um, flexible furlough. And I'll just pass back over to Trishna again. So Abby's already touched on uh, quite a bit to do with rotating furlough arrangements. So uh, you might recall that right at the very beginning of all this, I know that I was having conversations with client, uh, clients a lot about how we can perhaps rotate teams A, team B, team C. Um, and the idea of doing that was Number one, if someone within team A was to test positive for coronavirus, then everyone in that team would have to self-isolate if they come into contact with each other. But that then doesn't mean that the business grinds to a halt because team B and C are still there to be able to fall back on and rotate and keep everyone safe. It also does make it easier to, to help with the whole social distancing measures because the more people you have in one place, the harder it is to implement that. And as you can see, we're having to improvise today, um, but it makes it a lot easier when you've got a boardroom and there's only two of us in it. Um, so, of course, that is another reason to consider having rotating teams. It also makes sense because from a perspective of choosing who to bring back, as Abby said, this all needs to be done within the parameters of making sure that you're not singling out anyone, that no one feels that they're being discriminated against or kept at home because they've got a disability or whatever. Um, so having rotating uh, teams makes it actually fairer for everyone and alleviates that risk of any um, anybody trying to allege that you've, you've made the decision based on any sort of protected characteristic. Um, so that helps as well. Um, and of course, there is a reduced amount of work. So initially it was helping because people didn't have enough work for everyone, but it would give team A and team B a nice equal split. So in practice, it was made a lot more difficult in the beginning because of the three week um, requirement for you to be on furlough. And in those initial couple of months, every three weeks, there were so many changes that it was difficult for businesses to then keep that consistently going. Um, so hopefully with the introduction of flexible furlough, you might want to reconsider doing this now because it does work a lot better. Um, and obviously you do know that those individuals who are on full furlough, so they're not working in week one, they're getting their, their wages are covered at the 80%. And team A who might be in the office and actually work in some hours will also be getting paid and hours they're not doing that they normally would have done are obviously covered by the grant. So the employee isn't losing out in any way really um, because it's fair, it's alternating weeks. So you shouldn't be facing much resistance from them. And as Abby has said, it, you do need to be utilizing the scheme. It's a very generous scheme um, in, in some people's view. Um, and obviously if you are utilizing it correctly, it can help get your business up and running again, get the income coming in and also help the economy, which is another aim of the government in introducing this, is to get people back out spending money uh, and, and use, getting the economy kind of pumped again. Um, so what I would be mindful of um, that we are going to come on to again, as I said before, is, is when you're thinking about this, don't just think about calculations, but if you have started redundancy uh, processes and you've put people at risk, and you then call them back in um, and they're working and their hours are then increasing week by week on the flexible scheme. Just be mindful of that because obviously if your business case is that there is a diminished need for work of a particular kind, well then actually you're calling employees back into work um, and there is work for them to be doing, then that could kind of undermine your business case. So just be careful with that. There are also other things to consider that on the flip side of the coin, if they're coming in and there isn't enough work to even fill 20% of the hours they would normally do, then it does, of course, evidence and demonstrate and bolster the business case that you've put forward. So you could think about that as well. Um, Abby mentioned as well at the beginning that there is a limit on the number of employees that you can now claim for in any claim period. Um, and basically, in a summary, what that means is that by the 30th of June in that claim period, if out of 30 staff you only claimed for 20 and the other 10 were back in work, 
uh, and weren't on furlough at all, then your claim period, your amount of claims will be capped at the 20. Uh, um, and at any one time, you would then have to fall within that number. Now, it doesn't apply, the maximum doesn't apply to where people are being brought back on stat from statutory leave um, or military reservists, which was also updated in the guidance uh, not long ago, who can now be furloughed if they weren't previously. So how much work can employees do? We've already said there's no minimum requirement. And one of the FAQs we received um, in the, in the run-up to this session was how flexible is flexible, um, which the answer really is how long is a piece of string. But at the minute, what we're seeing is that the guidance is very clear that you can bring people back on any shift pattern for any amount of time. So that does indicate that there is a lot of flexibility for employers. Um, and provided that this is properly documented in your written agreement, then it does seem that you can kind of do this on a week by week, day to day kind of basis. I mean, day to day is probably going to be administratively too difficult. But if you start thinking uh, and making sure you're communicating what you expect for the following week, um, then that should work out pretty well. Um, and whilst, em uh, whilst employees are on furlough, as Abby has said, they can't undertake any work, but they can still be doing the training um, provided that they're receiving national minimum wage as a minimum. So bear that in mind as well. So can employees refuse to return to work part time? I don't know about you guys in your businesses, but I've certainly had a lot of clients facing resistance from employees wanting to come back to work. Um, and, it, and it has been quite difficult to manage, but the advice is to deal with each one on its own merit. Uh, it is very much a case by case sort of basis. Now, in reality, you can't compel employees to come back to work part time because your original furlough agreements will presumably have said that once furlough is lifted, they'll revert back to their old terms and conditions. And if they weren't working part time before, then this is, of course, a change to those. So you do need to be obtaining their agreement. Um, however, what happens if you've got an employee who just refuses? Well, if they are reviews, refusing um, on the basis of health and safety concerns um, or that they, they don't feel particularly safe coming back to work, it's really important to deal with those very sensitively because there is enhanced protection under the Employment Rights Act for those people who feel that they're at serious risk or of in, imminent danger. Um, and they are protected from dismissal. But not only that, they could potentially be making protected disclosures, which is whistleblowing complaints. And if they were then to suffer a detriment, i.e. you then discipline them for it, then you could, you could end up with an automatic unfair dismissal on your hands if they resign, um, and or, or you dismiss them for that matter. So we need to be careful with those. If it's the other category of employees who have potentially been sat at home with their families, they've never done this before, they've been paid 80% and they've actually quite got used to this and they're enjoying it so they don't want to come back, then of course the approach is very different. And if someone is unreasonably refusing to agree to come back part-time and work for you, you might want to consider dismissing them on the basis of some other substantial reason, which is lawyer's favourite reason for a dismissal because you can kind of put anything under there but the difficulty with doing that is there isn't any case law it hasn't been challenged yet um, how the tribunals are going to see this and look at it but they will of course be taking into account the whole situation the pandemic the impact that's had on businesses the fact that these employees are you know they're not on board with the company's values they're not helping the company to get back and recover those kinds of things could be taken into account you do need to be mindful of those, as, as Abby briefly mentioned before, who are at clinic that are categorised as clinically vulnerable or at risk. Um, those individuals you need to be careful, not only from the perspective of their health and safety and duty of care, but you need to be careful that if they were to come back to work and they suffered any particular injuries or they contract COVID and then they have any long-term effects, you know, you may be then looking at personal injury claims as well as a whole host of employment rights. So you do need to be careful looking after those employees, making sure it's safe for them. If they are wanting to come back to work, have you put things in place to make sure it's safe for them to do so? Can they be kind of separated from other people? Um, and you need to make sure you've got your risk assessments in place and that you've communicated these and shared these with your staff so that they can read them and see 
how safe they are actually going to be at work. And that is probably the only way that you're going to encourage them back. Um, and I think my advice from a personal perspective is, is that communication is key and encouragement because it is a lot of change. We've all adapted to sitting at home, which none of us wanted to do in the first place. You know, when, it, when you're told to do something, you don't usually want to do it. But when it's optional, people do. Um, so that was a big change and, uh, and a lot of people adapted. And now you're adapting people back into the workplace, which perhaps has happened a bit sooner than people anticipated. Um, things are now starting to move a lot quickly and restrictions have been uh, you know, relaxed a little bit and things have changed. So people are now adapting again. So be patient, deal with them on a case by case basis, listen to what they have to say. And then if you do have any of those nuisance employees who just don't want to come back and they don't really have a reason, then have a look at how you deal with those and whether you do discipline or potentially go down the SR, SO, SR route. So I'll hand back over to Abby now. Thank you, Trishna. I think this is surprisingly working quite well. None of us has fell off our chairs yet. Um, but yeah, just, just sort of a, a final piece from me, I guess. Um, and we did touch on this earlier, sort of when I looked at, you know, choosing employees to flexibly furlough. And it's certainly a question that, you know, we have been um, receiving um, quite a bit from clients. Um, and it relates to, you know, requiring employees to return to work part time whilst, you know, childcare may still be closed. Um, so, you know, while some nurseries and schools have uh, reopened to a limited extent, um, you know, they are only taking limited numbers of children each day. Um, it's coming up to the summer holidays and, you know, many holiday camps and um, they've been cancelled. Um, it's unclear whether schools will fully reopen and um, for all year groups in September. And, you know, as a result of this, um, you know, many parents will, will therefore have, you know, continuing childcare issues, um, which may effectively prevent them from, you know, returning to the workplace. Um, and I think just a bit of guidance on that, you know, and employers should be mindful that um, a requirement for all employees to return to the workplace regardless of their particular circumstances and um, may be classed as a, a provision criterion or practice or so PCP and um, that indirectly discriminates against um, you know women for example who statistically do have you know the greater childcare responsibility um, so employers should consider you know what arrangements can be made for employees with ongoing childcare issues such as you know allowing them to continue to work from home um, or with flexibility regarding, um, you know, the times that they work, you know, obviously where this is possible. Um, an employer who dismisses an employee in these circumstances um, will risk, um, you know, a successful discrimination claim. Um, and employers should also be mindful that, you know, whilst it, it may be an inconvenience now, um, you know, and, and it may be frustrating when you're asking people to return to work and they're saying, you know, I can't because I've got childcare issues. Um, you know, the, the employee childcare difficulties will be temporary um, and, you know, they may only be relatively short term. So, so you know, do bear that in mind. Um, and, you know, think about alternatives then. Um, and in terms of, you know, alternatives, these could be, you know, to, to continue to fully furlough the employee. Um, or, you know, allow them to take annual leave, um, parental leave or, you know, unpaid leave um, to cover the gap in, in the childcare uh, child um, arrangements. And then finally, we did say that we would touch on this. Um, and again, it's something that we've been asked quite, um, quite a lot um, relating to, you know, the termination of employment actually during furlough, during the scheme. And, um, you know, can we make somebody redundant whilst they're on furlough and whilst the scheme is still live? Um, so on that, I mean, the Employees Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme guidance confirms that an employee can be made redundant um, while on furlough or, or afterwards um, and you know and that an employee's redundancy rights will not be affected by being furloughed. Um, although that's the case one thing to note that is clear in the in the employer's guidance is that an employer cannot claim the reimbursement of um, any redundancy payments or statutory redundancy payments under the scheme itself. 
that um, that is something that the company does have to bear the cost of. Um, so although the guidance then confirms, you know, that a furloughed employee may be made redundant, um, there has certainly been criticism of employers that have taken this approach. Um, you know, calls that they've acted too soon rather than, um, you know, waiting to see how things pan out over the next couple of months. Um, it's also difficult at this stage to determine, you know, whether an employment tribunal would find such a dismissal to be unfair at this stage. Um, you know, in accordance with, with the test for reasonableness under, under the Employment Rights Act, um, it will depend on the particular circumstances of the case. Um, you know, and this will include the size and, you know, the resources of the employer. Um, in terms of particular circumstances, you know, whether an employer takes a decision to make an employee redundant rather than furlough them and um, sort of, you know, before the scheme comes to an end, um, and, you know, the financial position of the employer, these are likely to be relevant circumstances, you know, that will be taken into consideration. Um, there will also have been cases, you know, where an employer could not afford to actually furlough employees back in March when the scheme was first introduced and, you know, pay the 80% of that salary until, um, until you know, the HMR scheme was, was opened um, on the 20th of April and, you know, they were able to claim back that reimbursement. Um, so while those employers could have asked for the employees to agree to defer any payments um, until reimbursement was received, from HMRC, um, some employees may have been unwilling to agree to this, um, or they may not have been, you know, in a fin financial position to do so. And you know, in those circumstances, it may have been fair for an employer to, to dismiss for, you know, on the basis for redundancy. Um, Although the scheme itself has now been extended till the 31st of October, you know, as we've discussed, employers are required to make a financial contribution towards furloughed employees' furlough pay from the 1st of August. Um, so, you know, furloughing employees beyond that date then will therefore come at a cost um, to employers. And, you know, it may therefore still be, you know, fair reason for employers to make furloughed employees redundant despite the extension of the scheme, given that introduction of, you know, the contribution. Um, you know, while the government has put many measures in place to assist struggling uh, businesses, um, including the scheme itself, um, you know, some businesses will still be forced to close, unfortunately, you know, particularly if the pandemic is protracted and, you know, making redundancies, therefore, is, is likely to be inevitable. Um, but just bear in mind that, you know, where the business is continuing and employees are made redundant prior to the end of the scheme, there is a potential for the dismissal to be, to be unfair. Um, so I guess in summary, you know, the option to, to furlough employees will not mean that a dismissal will be unfair. Um, you know, in the current climate, some jobs have genuinely been eliminated and, you know, workplaces have closed. Um, and, you know, the fact that there may be a possibility that an employer may need employees in similar roles sometime in the future does not mean that an employer must continue to furlough employees. Um, however, employees, employers should be able to show that they have, you know, considered furloughing as an alternative to redundancy um, for each type of role, you know, that they consider to be redundant. Um, and it's important that, you know, you document your reasons why it would not be suitable in the particular circumstances um, of the case, you know, to continue to furlough somebody. I'll just pass you back over to Trishna. Okay, so we're coming to an end now and we're conscious of time because we do want to have a couple of Q&As. Um, we're going to do a couple more polls before we, we finish. Um, and as Abby mentioned at the beginning, these are anonymous and we would encourage you to, to put your answers on there because it gives us a better picture of, of what you guys have been doing and how you've dealt with things. So Gabs, can you run the second poll, poll for us? Okay, so we've got... 70% of people haven't dismissed yet or made any redundancies and we've had 30% that have. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Um, and, and obviously we can't really have a conversation, but if you put it in the chat box, some of the reasons as to why uh, you have or you haven't, then obviously amongst yourselves, you can have that conversation and get some ideas and thoughts off other businesses. Um, and we've got a second, uh, third poll, sorry, Gabs. Um, if you can run that now. 
So do you foresee then that redundancies will need to be made either during or following the expiry of the CJRS scheme? Because at the minute, obviously, quite a lot of you haven't made any, um, but we do foresee that that might happen in the future. So we just want to see what your thoughts are on that. Oh, okay. That's an interesting mix. Um, I was thinking that we were going to see a lot higher for yes than we have, um, but, but that's actually welcome news and a lot more positive uh, in that case. Um, well, what we wanted to, to do was to get an idea of how many of you bus of businesses were thinking of going into redundancies because we are actually now running some sessions to assist employers with that. We have seen on our end a lot of clients starting consultation process, particularly where it's collective consultation and you've got the 30 or the 45 day consultation requirement. A lot of those have started now uh, and we've had some of our uh, smaller clients, SMEs that have been, you know, they've put together their business cases. They've essentially deemed that the delay in the inevitable and decided that they are going to have to make redundancy sooner because of the tapering of the scheme. Um, and therefore, what we thought was, was a good thing to run over the next couple of months is some more assistance on redundancy. So we're going to do the first session, which is identifying appropriate pools for redundancy, how to pool employees, who to include in each pool, and then how to deal with them. Um, and then we're running at the end of August, one on selection criteria, because this is really important to get right. Um, not a lot of businesses have been through these kind of mass scale redundancies before so you might not already have selection matrix matrixes and, and criteria in place and there are a lot of things to consider that you know for example with length of service just as a as a pure example that it could actually be indirectly discriminatory and people don't always think about that so um, we are going to run that session to give you some tips and tricks and some guidance on the things to think about um, so if you're a HR complete or in-house client then you will of course have free places on those sessions uh, and for client, for non-HR complete and in-house clients it's £60 plus VAT per delegate per training session. So we did get some FAQs in advance and we've got a couple of minutes left to run through those so we'll just push the laptop back so we can get both of us just in the screen there. Um, so we have had a quick look at those that you've sent through and we'll go through as many as we can. I can see um, briefly that a few of you have put some in the chat as well, which we'll try and have a quick look at if we've got time. Don't worry if we don't get to your question because we are going to, number one, be sending around a recording of this. Um, so if any of those questions have been answered already, you can look back and, and have a look at that. Um, and equally, we will follow up with you or, as Abby said at the beginning, our details will be on the next slide, uh, which I can put up for you so you can start taking those down if you need to. And you can email either one of us or both of us if you've got any questions that you, we didn't get to cover. So um, the first question, one of the ones we received was, does employment law offer any protection to an employee who is refusing to return to work following a nine week period of furlough? Um, so we have talked about this already in the session, but I'll go over it again. Um, and the first thing is to understand on what basis they are refusing to return to work. It is very much, as we said, the individual circumstances. If it's legitimate health and safety concerns, then there is a provision, which I think is section 101A or something like that, under the Employment Rights Act, um, which states that if somebody feels that they're in serious or imminent danger in the workplace, and by that virtue of that danger, they refuse or they leave, if they are then dismissed, then that will be considered an automatic unfair dismissal. And it's important to remember they don't need to have the two year service requirement for that claim. Also, as I mentioned earlier, you need to be careful because how they raise those health and safety concerns could well be a protected disclosure. And one of the elements of whistleblowing is that they have a reasonable belief that something is in breach of obligations, not that you actually have. So it's irrelevant that you've put all these things into place and social distancing measures and things have been implemented. It's actually the individual subjective belief, um, sorry, yeah, their subjective belief that then means that it could be still a protected disclosure. So if they're then disciplined for not coming back to work, then that could be seen as a detriment suffered 
uh, as a result and it could be victimisation. So you do need to be careful. There is some employment law um, rights that are kind of nuanced and we don't deal with as often as we're now going to perhaps see. Um, the other thing to remember is their contracts of employment, they still stand. Um, you know, the hours, the pay, all of that. Yes, we have varied that for furloughing employees, but you need to be careful that you're working within the parameters of that. And as we said earlier, you can't just automatically reduce pay. You can't automatically assume that they can come back part time. You do need to ideally be getting their agreement to that. And whilst it does actually say in the guidance that employees don't need to respond. We would be getting, asking you to get them to sign these agreements so that it is clear that they consented and they agreed. Uh, and then there's no argument they were working under protest or anything like that. Um, so I'd be careful, careful with that. Obviously, the other flip side of the coin, as we mentioned before, if it's just that they don't want to come back because they're enjoying sitting at home, then you can deal with that a lot more strictly. So I'll pass yeah. to um, I'll just quickly try and run through some of the others because I am conscious of time. You can see the clock ticking away there. Um, one of the questions that we got asked in advance was, I would be interested to know more about the employee's rights when the percentage paid under the scheme reduces. Um, now, it's not entirely clear what the question is here, but um, you know the employee's rights will not change um, you know, as the, the percentage changes over the coming months. Um, and in fact, from the employee's perspective, um, nothing will, will be changing they'll still be receiving, you know, 80% of the wages for the hours that they are furloughed, obviously subject to the cap. And um, it will just be the company that, you know, has to contribute more to the 80% and, you know, to the national insurance contributions um, and pension contributions as the months progress. Um, now, if there is a more specific question there, then, you know, please feel free to, to follow up with, with either myself or Trishna after the session, or um, we are actually running sort of weekly um, education Q&A sessions. So do have a look on our website um, and you can book onto that and ask a more specific question um, on that one. Perfect. Um, the next question that we had was, please inform us of the basic process of the furlough payment. We have gone through a basic calculation. So on account of time, I'm going to pass back to Abby to do another one. What I would say is that you have a look at the examples that I said were on the gov.uk. There's lots of really good examples to calculate on there and try and run the calculator and see if you're getting the same results. Um, but in terms of calculations, it is obviously slightly out of our remit. So we would encourage you to speak to your accountants on that. Thanks, T. Um, somebody submitted the question, what will be the biggest challenge for businesses following furlough and what impact will this have on UK employment law? Um, a really interesting question. Um, I think the standout challenge for me is that you know, redundancies are going to be inevitable. Um, coronavirus has undoubtedly you know, affected our economy. And, you know, unfortunately, I do see people, um, you know, losing the jobs off the back of this. Um, you know, I was speaking to someone on the other day who, who, you know, is taking the view that for them, you know, they're utilising the scheme so as to protect as many jobs as possible. And, you know, and I think that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, you know, but bearing in mind what I did touch on earlier about, you know, the importance also of bringing people back to work so that the business can get off to the best possible start once the scheme comes to an end in October. And um, I also think, you know, there's a common misconception that if you no longer, you know, want somebody within the business or you feel that, um, you know, you, you don't need them anymore, you can just make them redundant um, and that's OK. And I would be cautious about taking that approach, you know, from a legal perspective, there's a the statutory definition of a redundancy situation. And as ever with employment law, you know, a process must be followed. And, you know, it's important that businesses do still follow the correct procedures, regardless of the circumstances. Otherwise, you know, the, you do risk an unfair dismissal claim. And, um, you know, as I touched on earlier, at this stage, we just don't know what the approach of the tribunals is going to be. Um, you know, what approach they're going to take to dismissals off the back of coronavirus. Um, you know, we just don't know whether they're, they're going to say, you know, okay, well, in normal circumstances, um, you know, that would be unfair, but recognise that actually we're not in normal circumstances, in which case, you know, a decision may be fair. Um, so I think just, just, you know, obviously bear that in mind and where possible, you know, make sure that you are still following the normal procedures because otherwise you do risk, you know, claims. And, you know, with that, I think there is going to be a significant increase in the number of employment tribunal claims. So that is something that, you know, many businesses are likely to face. 
Um, Trishna, do you want to do one more? Yeah, we'll just do one or two more. Um, so in respect to flexible furlough, if the amount of part-time hours work changes, would you advise a new agreement for this at each change or is there a better way to do this? So we did talk about this earlier um, in that what we would suggest is that if you have a very thorough and detailed flexible furlough agreement in place what you can then do is reserve the right for some additional flexibility in there and then what you can do is issue side letters or emails or uh, messages or whatever it is that at the start of a week then demonstrates and documents the hours that they are then due to be working um, and the hours that they would be then furloughed and you can obviously use that for your written records as you need to keep records of the, the hours worked and the hours furloughed that is obviously good evidence and it saves you having to then write it down and go and put it elsewhere although we would recommend having like a spreadsheet or something like that with those hours saved and stored um, so in answer to the question I don't think you need to issue an agreement every single time but it is going to depend on how you draft the agreement in the first place and the final question that was submitted in advance then, how flexible is flexible furlough? How much notice do we need to give to bring people back and then we furlough? Can we be fluid on hours per week or do the hours have to be pre-agreed? Um, there are no current notice requirements set out in the guidance, and you know, but the, the principle of reasonable notice, I guess, will still apply. Um, and just from a practical point of view, you know, the more notice that you can give somebody and um, you know that they're coming back to work um, from both a business planning and you know an employee morale perspective um, the better um, and this is the case you know unless your previous furlough agreement stipulates that a certain amount of notice must be given and um, in which case you should give the notice that was set out in that in that furlough agreement and um, in terms of hours we have already talked about this but to summarize and um, yes you can be fluid and um, I just make sure that you know you cover this off in the main agreement and you know, including the, that they will be notified of the exact working arrangements separately in advance of any working period. So just make sure that's set out in there. Um, I think that was all of the questions that we received in advance of the webinar. I'm conscious that we are all now sort of ticking past 11 o'clock. Um, so what we will do is, is, is we'll end the session now, I think, and if me and Trishna have a look at the Q&As that have come in, um, hopefully um, they will have been answered anywhere during the session, but if not, we'll follow up with you um, following, uh, following the webinar just to answer those questions. Does that sound okay? Yep, that's yeah. brilliant. Thank you for bearing with us. Obviously, we have run over a little bit, so we hope we haven't kept you uh, for, for longer than necessary. Just as a reminder, the session is recorded and will be sent out to you. Um, and if, if you have got any other questions that arise, you know, off the back of this, then our details are on the slide. So please feel free to contact us. And otherwise, we look forward to hopefully seeing some of you in person again soon um, or at our next sessions on redundancy in August. See you later. Thank you. Bye now.